gonna sing your name so that my heart can dance with freedom. I lift you high as a burning flame, as a light to all who need you. I'm crying for this generation, waiting on your revelation. I long to let your will be done. I'm standing in the gap and praying. Open up the gates of heaven. Oh God, let your kingdom come. Hit revolution. To the world who needs a Savior Let the heaven shake as we make a stand For a King who is forever I'm praying for this generation Waiting on your revelation I long to let your will be done I'm standing in the gap and praying Open up the gates of heaven Oh God, let your kingdom come In revolution Okay, church, coming back together. How many of us can say the last time we were late was actually this morning? <laughs> Be honest. Let me ask you to stand as you're able, sing as you will. We are here to worship God. To worship him and to praise him. Amen? Amen. It's because of who he is that we worship it's because of what he's done that we praise him. It's all good. Let's say it together. It's all good. One more time. It's, it's all, all good. good. Amen. Let's sing Worship You. Glory come to honor you. 
in front of him. As God's people, we see things differently, don't we? We see things through his lens. We do things according to what he has asked us to do. We don't quite look the same as everybody else because we're always at peace. It may, things may not always be good, but we can always be at peace because we have God and when God is for us, who can be against us? We're going to sing that we give him our hearts. Amen. I give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus. And you are my God.
For many, uh, this moment in worship is uh, seen just as something that we get through, a plate gets passed, money gets dropped in, and we move on. But for others, many of us here, this moment is a time of, of intense worship, a time of intense trust. Periodically, over the past few weeks, you've been hearing words from people, sharing testimonies about their understanding of giving. Actually, uh, first came to Courthouse in August of 2000. Um, I had just recently re relocated to this area, and I had been, I guess, church hopping for lack of a better word. Um, but because of the nature of my work and my travels, um, you know, it caused me to have to find churches to go to because I traveled extensively for, you know, anywhere up to 90, 90 180 days or longer. Um, and I tended to go to a church where people look like me. So even though I was not born and raised um, AME, I would go to like AME churches out of the area. You know, if I was out of the area, I'd go to an AME church because I was guaranteed that there were people there that looked like me. And um, one of my neighbors, I live in Courthouse Estates, and one of my neighbors um, said, you should come to Courthouse Community. And I came and I think probably at that point in time, I had probably visited three or four other churches, and I came here, and just the warmth that I felt from everybody here caused me not to go to any place else. I came here, and somebody, I sat behind these people, the, uh, uh, the uh, Donaldsons, and they were like, oh, you should be singing on the choir, and I started singing on the choir probably like the week or two after that, and I never went any place else, so I've been going to Courthouse since August of 2000. I think for me, because of the good things that I see that are done here at Courthouse, I mean, the mission work, the work that's done with the kids, the um, hoagies for the homeless, I mean, just so many outreaches to the community. And to me, that's all about being a part of a church. Um, it's, you know, reaching out and uh, reaching out and touching those people that you might not talk to or reach out to on a daily basis, but they are nonetheless in need. And I think that um, Courthouse does a very good job of reaching out to those people. And um, and that's just, I mean, that's very important to me. I don't think that it was necessarily a difficult decision for me because I've grown up in the church and I was always trying to give. But I will honestly say that once I started coming here, I felt like I really wanted to give more. And I will say, um, when I first started coming here, I wasn't married. Um, my husband has since joined the church, and he's military, and he moved all around, so I don't know that he was necessarily um, as closely entrenched with the church as I have always been, because I've always been pretty much in, in one area, so, you know, even if I moved, I'd be in an area for a certain amount of time, and I'd be a attached to a church. You know, I was trying to get him to join the church, and I thought, you know what, this has to be his own decision. I cannot force him into something. and. I just can't tell you how my heart was so happy when he decided that he wanted to join the church. And with nothing that I had said or done, he just decided that he wanted to join the church. And um, I think, you know, if you're you're married or in whatever kind of relationship, you I think you both need to be on the same accord as far as the giving. And I can say that I honestly feel like that Shelton and I are both on that same accord. That when, you know, Pastor Randy sends out an email message, there's, you know, a need for a family or, you know, a need for to bring on a new instructor or a new teacher and they need funds for that. You know, Shelton and I look at each other and we're like, okay, take the check over to the church kind of thing. So, I mean, I think that's very important that, you know, it's like I said, if you're in a relationship that you both need to be on walking the same walk. I see so many great things that are going on here. I mean, I've been in the church my whole entire life, and I've not ever been involved in a church where there was so many, what I felt were good things that were going on. I mean, the youth, um, taking care of the homeless, um, you know, winter nights when the homeless people will be here in, G in January, 
just and the mission trips that are done, all kinds of things. So I mean, that's very important to me. And I just, you know, I don't have a large family in this area, but I feel like Courthouse has become my family. And that's very important to me. I mean, I, it's nice to belong to a place where if you're not there, somebody calls or sends you an email message and said, hey, just want to check and make sure that you're okay. You have to look deep within yourself. And somebody had posted something on my Facebook page and it's like when God increases your finances, don't increase your standard of living, increase your standard of giving. And that is what I think that Shelton and I are trying to live for, that people that know us know that we like to go on vacations and we do that quite often. But I can tell you that even with giving to the church has not affected our standard of living or our ability to do things, um, you know, to support our family members as we need to support them. So I just think that you have to, you know, you have to pray, pray and think about it and think about what the church is doing. And if it's something that you really want to do, then I just think you, you do it. And uh, I'm a firm believer that um, God will make a way and, you know, you make sacrifices and things come back to you tenfold. was lost but now I'm found I once was lost but now I'm found so far away but I'm home now I once was lost but now I'm found I once was blind, but now I see. I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know how, but when he touched me, I once was blind, but now I see. And now my life song sings. And now my life song sings. And now my life song sings. I once was dead, but now I Thank you.
to answer out loud, but uh, in your own mind, just uh, think about how do you decide what to do on any particular day? What is important? What is vital? What is urgent? What is, what is needed? Usually what we do whenever we have a, a list of things that we have to do during the day is, is particularly if we don't have enough time to do them all, is we begin to prioritize. We decide what are the things that we need to do first and, and what are the things in our to-do list that are most important and most urgent and most vital. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that uh, people uh, group or figure out how to achieve what they need to do on any particular day. Now, if you had all the time in the world and you know that you can achieve everything that you need to do on any particular day, it's, it's not a big deal. You just go about your day and doing the things that you need to do and, and there's not any pressure. But most of us have too many things on our to-do list to achieve in any one day. So we've got to prioritize. We've got to decide what's urgent, what's important, what do we need to do. There are a lot of different ways that people try to organize their to-do lists uh, to prioritize what they have to do on any particular day. One of the ways is to arrange them in this kind of a matrix, this quadrant system, where you list everything based upon whether it's urgent or important. So in one quadrant, you have urgent and important. Another, you have urgent and not important. Another, you have uh, important but not urgent. And in the fourth quadrant, you have neither urgent nor important, but just something that you'd like to do today before you go to bed at night. And so uh, most of us uh, can pretty much group everything that we have to do into one of those categories, and you know what it is for you, what is urgent and important, and you know what it is for you that today is neither urgent nor important, but you're going to try to get it done today. And everybody has a, a different categories for all of those things. And uh, the urgency of doing this, uh, this kind of matrix, this kind of quadrant understanding is, is only there because we don't have enough time during the day to get most of the things done. We don't have enough time. Now, the tendency of most people is to somehow focus on those things that are urgent, okay? And so we, we go after and we start doing the things that are urgent and important, and we do the things that are urgent but not important, whatever they happen to be. And uh, that may work for most of us most of the time, but again, if we don't have enough time to do everything, then what might happen, what might slip through the cracks is that we actually end up not doing some things that may not be particularly urgent, but are vitally important by focusing on the things that are urgent. There's a Sunday school class that's starting, uh, Bill Heibel's class, uh, over in the Family Life Center Narthex uh, gathering space uh, entrance, and uh, they're going to be talking about how to focus on this for the next few weeks, how to figure out your life, how to organize your life in a, in a better way. And uh, most people who study this, time management people, sociologists, psycho different people, will tell you that the struggle is if you focus on those things that are urgent, then some important things don't get done. A better practice is to focus on those things that are important. 
to do those things that are urgent and important first, and then to also spend some time doing those things that are important, but maybe not necessarily urgent, but need to get done. Because then if we run out of time, what we're left with falling through the cracks, what doesn't get done are those things that aren't important. They may just be some things we'd like to do. And uh, if we get to them, fine. But if we don't, then, you know, they'll wait till tomorrow, next week, next, next year, because they're not really important. They're just some things that we wanted to do. But then we make sure that when we go to bed at night, the important stuff gets done. Urgent, maybe not so urgent but important. And it sure helps with sleep because we don't have to lay awake at night dreading the fact that we didn't finish those important tasks that should have been done. And so if you focus on this, people that study time management tell us, uh, then the important things will get done and maybe a few of the unimportant things will get finished, we'll have time for. But what will happen occasionally is that we will find from time to time if we do the important things that extraordinary things will happen in our lives. For the past couple of weeks, we have been talking about uh, a texting slang uh, term that is pretty popular right now called YOLO, Y-O-L-O. Stands for you only live once. And uh, we know that whenever we send a text telling someone that we're going to do something or we're planning to do something, you remember in the urgent, important quadrant matrix, whenever we're going to do something, If it's something amazing, something out of the ordinary, something outside the box, and you get this response, you only live once, what that person is telling you is to go for it, to do it. It's going to be memorable. People are going to be talking about what you're doing forever because it's so far out of the ordinary, so far out of the box, you just got to try it because you only got one life. So go ahead and go for it. Do something extraordinary. In the Bible, in the book of Revelations, there is a church that is referenced there that, uh, by all accounts, is pretty successful, is uh, doing uh, what churches are supposed to do, and people who drive by, who see that church, who hear about that church in their minds, they they see success, but uh, at least according to the book of Revelations, they're not doing anything particularly extraordinary, particularly radical. Um, now, if, if you read the book of Revelations, and you know, regularly in the church, everybody wants to study the book of Revelations. Over the past 2,000 years, lots of theories, lots of interpretations of what the book of Revelation means, and current theory, current interpretation, whatever it is, is in vogue for 100 years or 150 years, and it kind of goes out, and a new theory or new interpretation comes in, and, and it depends on the time that you're living of, of how you interpret the book of Revelation, and so... Not really sure if you go and look at uh, studies, different people have different opinions on what the book of Revelations uh, is about, but there is one thing everybody agrees on. It begins as a letter, a letter to seven churches that are in what is current modern-day Turkey, and they have become, at least uh, in the past 2,000 years, kind of a, a typology, kind of an understanding of seven types of churches, And uh, there is a word in this letter where God is speaking to these seven churches about their current condition. And so we can all agree that in one particular time, seven churches received a letter, this book of Revelations. Now, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, God is able to take those words and speak to us today, 2,000 years later. And so Uh, We're going to be looking at one of those churches today, and it is in the city of Laodicea. And in this uh, city, modern-day Turkey, God has some words to say to them because, uh, well, uh, they're not doing in their planning of urgent, important, how they're living out their lives, nothing extraordinary. Hear the word of God. Revelations 3, verse 14. And the angel to the church, and to the angel of the church of Laodicea, write these words. The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. Here's the words of God. I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. What, what this is saying is that uh, God's looking down at this church and God is uh, not seeing much going on. In fact, that when God 
experiences them, it makes God want to gag. Okay? So I spit you out of my mouth. For you say, this is why, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now, these are not actual things. These are metaphors. What uh, God is telling the church at Laodicea is, uh, look, uh, everybody driving by thinks that you're successful, but you're not. Everybody driving by thinks that you are doing what church is supposed to do. You're not. And uh, if I look at you, even though you pretend that you're doing church stuff well, you're not, I wish you would get with the program. Clothe yourselves, see the world the way I see it, act the way I want you to act, do the things I want you to see. Verse 19, I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Change your ways. Listen, I am standing at the door and I'm knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. I will be in your presence. See, the picture here is that God's not even there. Even though they're the picture of a successful church. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in to you and I'll eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, the one who does what I'm asking, I'll give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This church had reached the place in their development, their system, where they had uh, money to pay the bills, they had a facility that made them comfortable, they had programs that were interesting, they had Good music, choirs, good preaching. Everybody driving by looked at this church there in Laodicea and said, that is a successful church. They've got it all together. But in those quiet moments where only they and God knew what they were talking about, what they were thinking, what they were really saying to God is, we've got it all covered. We don't need anything. We don't even need you, God. And the picture there in Revelation 3, 14, 22, is that God is standing at the door of that church, knocking, 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 wanting to come in. And nobody opens the door. To open the door, according to Revelation 3, is that they have to repent. They have to change their ways. They have to move from this attitude where I don't need anything to this place where I need God in everything. Now, that's a radical step for a church that had created this whole structure to where they didn't need God at all to suddenly creating a structure where in everything they do, every action they take, every beat of their heart, they have this deep desire for God. It's something radical. Now, in our world today, whenever we think of the term, the word radical and we think about it in terms of somebody, we think about somebody who acts pretty much like we act, but is uh, doing it a little different. Somebody who's a little little idiosyncrasy or, or something that they do that's a little bit different, sets them a little bit apart from us, because by and large, in Southampton Roads, we are all kind of the same people. And so radical is somebody who acts a little bit different. For the past couple weeks, we've been talking about what it means to be radical. The definition we've been using is this. A radical is uh, of or going to the root or origin and doing it to the extreme. That means going back to the basics and doing it to the extreme. In our case, going back to what it is God expects of us at the basic level and doing it in a radical way. Going to the extreme. Thorough going. And each week we've been talking about a different aspect of this radical lifestyle that we're supposed to to be living if a God is among us. And today the focus is going to be radical urgency. If you want a definition for that, it's getting a lot done in a short period of time in a calm and confident manner. 
vital and important. Getting a lot done in a short period of time in a calm and confident manner. Most of us in life have too many things on our to-do list to accomplish everything in any given day. And most of us, whenever we go to bed at night, have this list of things we didn't finish and we know we have to dump them on tomorrow's to-do list. And so we're always trying to figure out what is the most important, what's the most vital, uh, what is the most urgent thing that we're supposed to be involved in and making sure those things get taken care of and hopefully everything else will just fall into place. And if we're not careful, what happens is that we reach that place where God is push further and further down the to-do list and what God wants in our lives until we reach that place where we no longer need God at all. We carve out a system, we create a structure in our lives where everything's taken care of and uh, we don't need God at all. And again, the picture, metaphor from Revelation 3, God is standing there knocking, 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 wanting to get in. There's an adult study that starts today uh, using uh, the book Crazy Love. It's a book that was written by Francis Chan, bestseller. Millions of people have used it uh, since it was coming out. And uh, Jeremy Edsel is going to be is facilitating that beginning today. Uh, everybody's invited if you'd like to take part in it. But uh, many of you have already read the book because it was really popular uh, a while back. And if you read Crazy Love, if you go to chapter 4, chapter 4 is a profile of the lukewarm. It references Revelation 3. And Francis Chan spends some time there describing what a lukewarm churchgoer looks like. Here's some of the things that uh, Francis Chan says. Lukewarm people attend church fairly regularly. It's what's expected of them. It's what they believe good Christians do, and so they go to church. Lukewarm people give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. I I loved your quote, Deidre, from your... If you have a little extra, is what a lot of people say, uh, then what, uh, what we tend to do, most of us, is that we raise our standard of living and not our standard of giving. And so after all, uh, we even quote scripture, God loves a cheerful giver, right? And so we give a little extra when we have a little more. Lukewarm people tend to choose what is popular over what is right when they are in conflict. They desire to fit in at church and in their community and in their world, And so they care more about what people think than they do um, what uh, God thinks about their actions. Lukewarm people don't really want to be saved from their sin. They want only to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't genuinely hate sin, and they aren't really sorry for the things that they do. They're merely sorry because God is going to punish them for their sins. But they prefer to do the sins anyway. Lukewarm people are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume that such action is for extreme Christians, whatever that means, and that there's only a few people who can actually do what Jesus wants us to do, and so the rest of us don't even have to pay any attention to it at all. Lukewarm people rarely share their faith with their neighbors, their co-workers, or their friends. They do not want to be rejected nor do they want to make people feel uncomfortable by talking about something as personal as religion. So they just don't talk about it. Lukewarm people gauge their morality or their goodness by comparing themselves to the secular world. I'm not nearly as bad as Joe down the street or or Sally or whoever it is. So I must be doing okay. Lukewarm people say they love Jesus and he is indeed a part of their lives, but only a part. Lukewarm people give Jesus a section of their time, a section of their money, a section of their thoughts, but he isn't allowed to control their lives. Lukewarm people love God, but they do not love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They're quick to assume, uh, they'd be quick to assume that uh, they would try to love God that much, but that sort of total devotion isn't even possible for the average person. So why try? Lukewarm people love others, but do not seek to love others as much as they love themselves. Typically, what people do is they love those who are going to love them back. Family, friends, co-workers, neighbors. And uh, if there's time, I'll do something that shows I I care about you, even if you're not going to love me back. But by and large, 
the people that aren't going to love me back are the ones that we tend, lukewarm people tend to ignore. Lukewarm people will serve God and others, but there are limits to how far they will go or how much time, money, or energy they're willing to give. Lukewarm people think about life on earth much more than they think about eternity in heaven. Do you remember that uh, quadrant matrix? Urgent and important. By the time that we finish all of the things that we consider urgent and either important or very important or almost important, there's not much time for God. And so we spend more of our time taking care of earth stuff, our community, our world stuff, than we do taking care of our soul stuff, our connection to God. Lukewarm people are thankful for their luxuries and comfort and rarely consider trying to give as much as possible to the poor. They're quick to point out that Jesus never said that money is the root of all evil. Jesus said the love of money is the root of all evil. And so uh, lots of people who might be called lukewarm uh, feel that they're called to to minister to uh, the rich or uh, the wealthy, and they don't really have time for ministering... um, to the poor. I was at a church one time and we were having a, a board meeting and somebody, church council meeting, and somebody said, uh, was very serious about it, it said that, uh, you know, it's just as easy to evangelize a rich person as a poor person and we ought to go after the rich people. Right? There was that deathly silence there in that meeting too, but uh, he was serious. So, uh, um, lukewarm people do whatever is necessary to keep themselves from feeling too guilty. They they want to do the bare minimum to be good enough. They ask the question constantly, is this, how far can I go in this and not be sinning? Or when does it become a sin? And they want to do as much as they can not to feel guilty. Lukewarm people are continually concerned with playing it safe. They are slaves to the God of control. They focus on safe living that keeps them from sacrificing and having to impact their lifestyle in any way, playing it safe. Lukewarm people feel secure because they attend church, they went through confirmation, were baptized, they came from a Christian family, they vote a certain way, or they live in America, and because I'm doing these things, uh, I'm I'm okay. I don't have to feel guilty. Lukewarm people do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so they never have to. Laodicea. Revelation 3. They don't have to trust God if something unexpected happens. They dip into their savings account, their investments. They have a network of people that are going to pick them up when they fall. They never, ever have to live by faith. Lastly, Chan says, lukewarm people probably drink and swear less than the average. But besides that, they really aren't very different from your typical unbeliever. They equate their partially sanitized lives with holiness. Holiness. Being like God. Revelation 3, in that letter to that church in modern day Turkey, Laodicea, says that people living like that It makes God gag. God would rather that they were cold, dead, or on fire for Jesus. But because they're in that middle place, that lukewarm place, then lukewarm churchgoers convince themselves they're doing okay because they're average. Average. Francis Chan, Crazy Love, says this. God doesn't call us to be comfortable. God calls us to trust him so completely that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where he will be, where we will be in trouble if he doesn't come through. God doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to trust him so completely that we are, we, that we are unafraid to put ourselves in situations where we'll be in, tr- we'll be in trouble if he doesn't come through. Can you imagine taking that quadrant, that matrix, deciding what's urgent and uh, important, and somehow lifting up whatever whisper you're hearing from God that God wants you to do, even though it's uh, frightening, even though it's going to cause you to move out the place you don't want to go, to go ahead and go there, make that urgent and important, believing that I'm not going to succeed unless God is there with me. 
What you're doing in that moment is you're creating urgency. You're creating urgency. Now, how is it possible to do this? How is it possible to live, how's it possible to live like this? I, I want to go back to that, that verse we've been using as our foundational scripture for the past few weeks from Luke 18, 27. And you remember the story. Uh, Jesus is confronted by this guy, and he says, uh, what do I need to do to uh, make God notice me? What do I need to do to be seen as significant in the eyes of God? The question he asks is, what do I need to do to get to heaven? Jesus says, sell everything you got and give it to the poor. Follow me. Quit depending on your wealth and your investments and your securities. Quit being lukewarm and reach that place where you are totally dependent on me. And then you'll go to heaven. Now, in that story from Luke 18, there's like this, this silence, right? I mean, there's no response from the guy. Now, we know the guy's still there, and we know that there are people still listening because the disciples respond. Uh, wait a minute, Jesus. Uh, we're following you, but we haven't done that. I don't know how that's possible. So nobody's going to heaven? And Jesus answers with verse 27. It's impossible for you, but it's not impossible for God. Now, we've been talking over the past couple of weeks that how you interpret that verse is going to determine how you respond with the envelope we're going to be talking about in a few moments. If you interpret that verse, that I don't have to worry about what Jesus says, and I don't have to pay attention to what Jesus expects of me, and I don't have to live a certain life that Jesus has mapped out in Scripture for me to live, and God is still going to do some magic, miracle power and get me to heaven, and I don't have to worry about anything, and I interpret it that way, I'm going to respond a certain way today. Now, I'm not saying in this next word that God can't do that, but there's another way to interpret that verse. It could be interpreted that I know that I'm not doing what God wants me to do. I am living a lukewarm life. But God can do the impossible and change me. To move me from that place where I am totally trusting in myself and my investments and my money and my portfolio to that place where I am totally dependent on God. The church at Laodicea. Revelations 3. And if you can interpret that verse that way, that God can change me, the response in just a moment is going to be radically different. Because what God is calling us to do in Luke 18 and all the scripture passages for the past couple of weeks and in Revelations 3 is that we are called to be ordinary radicals. That's the word we've been using. We live ordinary lives, just ordinary people, ordinary neighborhoods, shopping at ordinary stores, going to ordinary schools, but we're doing it in a way that's radical. Going back to the beginning, going back to the root, going back to the foundation that Jesus talked to us about, and somehow doing it to the extreme. Living this, this radical life. Last Sunday when you were here, you got the envelope, right? Right? If you're on the church's email this week, you got it every day this week. If you're here today, you got it today. If you're a first-time visitor, I'm sorry. It's just how we do things uh, in the Methodist church in the fall. In this envelope is a piece of paper. On one side has uh, Luke 18, 27. Nothing's impossible for God. It's got the scripture verse, story, about the guy who comes and talks to Jesus about how to get to heaven. Then there's instructions. You know the instructions. You're supposed to be praying this week. Every day, every moment. Listening for some word from God. And then when you hear that word, complete the form. Just a couple of blanks. One of the things asked is a financial support for God's vision at courthouse in 2015. And the budget's on the back of the piece of paper. The other thing that's asked is not just money, but actions to commit to doing 100 acts of kindness um, in 2015. Average is about two a week in our uh, matrix, quadrant, uh, urgent, important, to-do list uh, way of handling it. Just two a week. Complete that piece of paper. Whatever it is you hear God calling you to do. Step out in faith, do it. 
live an ordinary radical life. Fold it up and put it in the envelope. Seal it and write your address, your name and address on the outside. There's a basket right outside the double doors. When you leave here, you put it in the basket. Nobody sees it. It's just you and God. It's just you and God. And then next June, you're going to get it mailed back to you as a reminder of what God spoke to you at this moment. Nobody sees it. Nobody's going to know. But God. Nobody's going to know whether you have made God important in your life. Now, I know this is going to take a big leap of faith to move you from where you are now to where you need to be in 2015, where you are as that guy who talked to Jesus in Luke 18, where you are like the church at Laodicea that uh, was pretty comfortable not uh, having to depend on God at all. It's going to take a leap of faith to somehow move to this other place where we are totally dependent on God for everything. Francis Chan, in his uh, book, has this quote. He says, The irony is that God doesn't need us, but still wants us. We desperately need God, but really don't want Him most of the time. Now, I know we're good church people. We, hey, I could be a member at Laodicea, and so could you, okay? God doesn't need us, but God desperately wants us. We desperately need God. But most of the time, we really don't want God. It's inconvenient, causes sacrifice. It's too difficult. Francis Chan has another quote in his book. He says this. He says, God is calling you into a relationship with him because the answer to religious complacency, lukewarmness, the answer to religious complacency isn't working harder at a list of do's and don'ts. It's falling in love with God. Because we sacrifice for the one we love, the ones we love. We go the extra mile for the ones we love. We do things for the ones we love. So it's not about a list of do's and don'ts on how to checklist. It's about falling in love with God. Today, this envelope is calling you to make God urgent and important in your life. Because the question that we ask regularly in this worship service is this, if not us, who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? Pray with me. God, we are so thankful that you love us, that you give us grace, that you give us mercy. But far too often, God, we are complacent. We don't put you first. We depend on ourselves and our education and our investments and our money instead of with every breath and every beat of our heart to depend on you. You're speaking to each one of us right now some word. I don't know what it is for others. I know what it is for me. And that word is frightening. That word is causing me and all of us to move beyond our comfort zone. To somehow step out on faith and say, the only way that I can do what you're telling me to do is if you come through and help me. Give me and give us strength to be your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing.
Let us go from this place celebrating God's love in all of our lives and share that love with everyone we meet. Amen.